The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and there repining till he appeared and the soul. Oh. 
Hello, everyone. I hope you're as excited for today as I am. Our good friend, Rudy Reindeer, is going to share one final story with us before Christmas. So turn on your listening ears and let's go find out what Bible story Rudy Reindeer has to share with us today. There's a story in the Bible that tells us what happened on Jesus' birthday. The story begins with Mary and Joseph. Can everyone out there say, Mary and Joseph? Mary and Joseph! Good job! Mary and Joseph loved each other very much. Baby Jesus was in Mary's belly, and it was almost time for him to be born. While they were waiting on baby Jesus to come, they had to take a special trip. So they loaded up their donkey and started on their way. I want all the listeners out there to pat your legs and make the sound of the donkey Mary was riding. Mary and Joseph had to travel somewhere far away so that they could be counted. The place they were going was called Bethlehem. Let me hear all my listeners say Bethlehem. Bethlehem! When they arrived, they went straight to the inn, but there were no rooms, so Mary and Joseph had to sleep in a barn with the animals. Can everyone in Radio Land say nay like the horse in the barn? Nay! While they were there, it was time for baby Jesus to be born. They wrapped him in blankets and laid him in the manger beside all the animals. Since this was the night that Jesus was born, that means it's his birthday. Now we celebrate Jesus' birthday every year at Christmas. How exciting! Jesus' birthday is just around the corner. The story of Jesus' birth is one of my favorites. I love being reminded each Christmas that Jesus was born because his parents, Joseph and Mary, loved one another. God loved the world, and Jesus loves us too. What a great reminder of love. Christmas is to us. This week in Advent, we are celebrating love. Love is more than just really, really liking someone. It is caring so much about them that you do your best to take care of them and keep them safe. Just like your parents show you great love each day by caring for you and keeping you safe. God showed us great love because he sent his only son, Jesus, to the earth to die for us so that we might live. That is a great act of love. We're going to sing a very special song to Jesus. This might give you a hint. It's a song that we sing every year to those that we care about, those that we love, to celebrate the day they were born. Let's make sure we sing nice and loud so that Jesus knows how much we love him. For today's craft, you will need your big piece of paper and your purple candle, the fourth candle. We are going to write the word love on this candle, L-O-V-E. Next, take a square of red construction paper, fold it in half, and cut out half of a heart. Next, we're going to glue, open the heart and write the word Jesus in our heart. This month we have talked about hope, peace, joy, and this week is love. And all of these things come because of Jesus. Next, glue your heart on the love candle. 
Next, grab your orange construction paper and your yellow construction paper. Make your orange pocket and put a yellow square in the middle. Glue it. After you glue your yellow square in your orange pocket, cut it into the shape of a flame. Cut each layer jagged so that you can see the yellow and the orange. Next, glue your flame on top of your love candle. And this reminds us that we are focusing on love this week. Wow, that was so much fun. I love getting to celebrate Jesus' birthday each year. Christmas is a time that we get to spend with loved ones. It reminds us how great God's love is because he sent his son to live on earth. I hope you remember how much Jesus loves you on Christmas and every other day of the year. Let's pray together before we say goodbye. God, thank you for Jesus' birthday. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for our friends, family, and loved ones. Amen. Friends, this has been such a special time, and I'm so happy I got to spend it with you. Don't forget, we want to see what you created today. So ask your parents to post a picture of you and your craft on the Springs page. Now, since it won't be completely finished until Jesus' birthday later this week, we hope that you'll post another picture with your completed Advent craft then. I am so excited to see what you did today and to see your completed craft after you've been working on it for weeks. I'll see you all later. Merry Christmas! Welcome to those who have joined us in person and welcome those online. 
Will you stand and join us in the call to worship? The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Our God has turned our weeping into singing. Our tears into songs of joy. O Christ of God, come anew in our hearts this day. And remain in us forever. praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful, for he made his promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right.
today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. Let's read Romans 6, verse 16, verse 25 through 27, as we light the candle of love this morning. Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for letting us be here today. Uh, Father, we ask uh, that this word love really radiates our hearts. We pray um, that this church family be known as that church who loves, who uh, love is just an, an extension of our name. Father, we, um, just pray that in hearing that word love, we be intentional in our acts in the next couple of weeks, that we think about people who um, might need um, a treat or who might need just a, a call from us. We pray that we truly uh, be an intentional people. We thank you for blessing us so Oh, we pray for those people in the next couple of weeks who just need somebody and need to visit with somebody. We pray that we uh, hear them. Uh, Father, uh, we just ask blessings on this church always. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand and welcome the King into our presence this morning.
Church. Welcome to everybody here in the room and welcome to those of you online. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. Next Sunday is the final Sunday of 2020. Hooray! And we've been focusing on the theme of gather this year. The irony has not been lost on us. But the Sunday after that, January 3rd is the first Sunday of 2021, and we're going to be focusing on a new theme, the theme of grow. We're going to be talking a lot about discipleship, about spiritual disciplines, about following Jesus in our daily lives. And so we're going to be starting off with a five-week January sermon series called God and Technology, Faithfulness in a Digital Age. So I hope you'll be here January 3rd, the first Sunday of 2021, as Ben kicks us off and we focus on a year of grow together. With that said, let's go ahead and finish out our fourth Sunday of Advent restoration this morning. We find ourselves in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 1 through 11 and 16. Now, when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given David rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See, now I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I've not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, 
Thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Let's pray together. Jesus, we give thanks for this word. We thank you for being the living word of God, showing us God truly. We thank you for your restoration and your love. I ask for the gift of preaching this morning. And we ask for your Holy Spirit's illumination. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. My father-in-law is a craftsman. He builds beautiful things out of wood. He built a guitar. He's built a bed for us. He built the house that Lara grew up in. I, on the other hand, am not. I don't build beautiful things with wood. I don't even build ugly things with wood, but I would if I did. And so you can imagine if I were to go up to my father-in-law and say, Larry, I need to build you a kitchen table. He's too nice, so he wouldn't say this, but the proper response would be, Brett, are you the one to build me a kitchen table? Like you, the guy who who doesn't build beautiful wooden things, are you the one to build me, the master craftsman, a table? David has been living in a palace, a house of cedar, of wood, and he sees that God is living in a tent. The Ark of the Covenant, God's presence on earth, is living in this mobile tent, this tabernacle, and David's like, that doesn't sit right with me. I can't be living in this beautiful palace of cedar while God's in a tent. And so Nathan is like, all right, go do whatever you're thinking. Go for it. God is with you. But God comes to Nathan later, and God sets the record straight. He says, Nathan, ask David, David, are you the one to build me a house? Are you the one to build me a house of cedar to live in? See, David has good intentions. He's got a good plan. It is a worthwhile endeavor to try and build a beautiful temple for God to live in. He has good intentions. But I also think, like all of us, David's intentions and motives might be a little bit mixed as well. You see, in the ancient world, for a king to build a temple for a god, it was about the god, but it was also about the king's own legitimacy. If the king was able to build a beautiful, fantastic temple for a god, it was also a kind of self-legitimizing for that king. So David might have good intentions and a good plan, but there's probably some selfish motives mixed in. And I think if we're being really honest in our heart of hearts, that's how we are too. Right? Even the good, at least for myself, even the good, godly, selfless, outward-facing things that I do. I know in my heart of hearts, a part of it is about my own legitimacy. So David has a good idea, if mixed motives. But God has a different plan. God has a different idea. And not only does God say, David, are you the one to build me a house? God has this wonderful reversal. Not only does he say, David, are you the one to build me a house? But in verse 11, God says, moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. 
Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God says, you're not going to make me a house, David. I'm going to make you a house. And there's a wonderful wordplay happening here in the text when God uses the word house. Because when David says house, he's talking about a wooden house of cedar, this temple. And God is alluding to that. He's going to let Solomon build this house, this temple, David's son. But when God says the word house, he's not just saying, David, I'm going to build you a wooden structure. No, God is saying, David, I'm going to build you a dynasty. I'm going to build you a house, a line, a legacy, a people. I'm going to establish your throne forever. God's plan transcends the finite, limited plan that David can conceive. David wants to build God a house of cedar, a house of wood. But God's ways are not our ways, and God's plan is not David's plan, and also God's not even using the same material. Because when God builds a house for David, he's not going to use wood. God's going to use a womb. Because the very house that God is talking about, the house of David, is the house that Gabriel visits in Luke chapter 1. In Luke 1, 26 and 27, it says that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. God doesn't come to build some beautiful, ornate cedar temple. God says, I'm not going to dwell in some palatial wooden dwelling. He said, I'm going to come dwell as a vulnerable little baby. I'm not going to use wood. I'm going to use a womb. Because God's plan transcends what David can conceive. God is coming in Jesus Christ. A lot of us had plans this year. We had plans, dreams, goals, ideas, projects. And then at some point, probably at least by March... A lot of those plans, dreams, goals, and ideas fell by the wayside. And we think, God, I was doing this for you. This was a good plan. This was a worthy endeavor. I was building that small business for you. I was working on my family for you. I was working on that nonprofit. I was building a church for you, God. And maybe all the further we even got on our plans, dreams, goals, and ideas was just to to break ground for a foundation. And so we ask, why? Why is it swept away? But we don't know what God might still do with that broken ground. We don't know what God might still do amidst the rubble and the ruin of what we have tried and attempted. For God might take the wood that we intended for a house, and he might instead make a manger. And the beautiful thing about the way God works is that When God comes to dwell in the flesh of Jesus, Jesus comes to dwell in us. That's what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 2. He says famously, I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. God comes to dwell in Jesus, and Jesus comes to dwell. To dwell in us. And once we've entered that household of David, which is what we do when we are grafted into the people of God, 
Once we've entered that household that God has built for us, because he's doing the building, he's the foreman. Once we enter the household, God seats us around his table. And it's at the table that God chooses to teach us how he's going to stitch us together as his body and dwelling. It's in the very next New Testament letter, Ephesians, that Paul says in chapter 2, verse 19, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. It's at the table that God teaches us what it means for him not to dwell in a palatial cedar temple, but to come dwell in the flesh and to come dwell in our flesh and to be stitched together around the table as the body of Christ. Church, may we learn what that means at the close of this year. And may we continue in the years ahead to learn what it means to be the dwelling place of Jesus Christ. Let's come to the tables this morning, church. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. To this week of Christmas, we're going to, um, if you would grab the candle that you were given when you came in, and I would ask you to stand uh, where you are, and we're going to sing four verses of Silent Night, uh, and as we're doing that, we're going to dim the lights and just kind of let this be uh, our thought and focus as we uh, head into this very special week. So let's sing together, O oh, Silent Night, Silent Night. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender. Sleep in heavenly peace.
Thank you for being here this week, church. And thank you for joining us online. We miss you and we love you. And we continue to await the time when we can all be together. I pray that you'll be well this week, that you'll be safe and healthy, and that you will live for the truth of God's word and God's coming in Christ. Our benediction this morning, our blessing, is may the hope, peace, joy, and love of Christ's coming dwell in you. Go in peace, church.